good afternoon. This is Pastor Batten, and I want to thank you for making the choice yet again to join us today. I am confident that God has a word that will challenge, that will change, and will give us direction for our lives. Before we get to a passionate time of worship and a directed word from the Lord, please pay attention to some announcements. Following our 4 p.m. service will be Singled Out Ministries Night. Singled Out is for those 18 and older who are widowed, divorced, or are single parents and those 30 and older who have never been married. Everyone in that category is welcome to join us. Please contact Sister Rachel Murray for meeting information. Monday is our annual Labor Day picnic at Waracoba Lake Bottom Park. We will meet next to the volleyball court. The church will provide hot dogs and drinks. If you would like anything other than a hot dog, please bring it thawed and seasoned to your liking, ready to be put on the grill. Everyone bring a side item to share with others. Tuesday at 6 p.m. is worship team practice for band and vocals. At 7 p.m., everyone join us in the sanctuary for Hour of Power Prayer. At 8 p.m. is RCP Sanctuary Choir Practice. Midweek matters in the life of a strong Christian. Join us at 7.30 p.m. Wednesday night for midweek Bible study. Thai Children's Ministry Bible classes for ages 11 and under will be in the Children's Ministry hallway and the mother's room will be available to those mothers who should need it. 12 and older will meet in the sanctuary for Bible basics. This is a Bible 101 class taught by Pastor Batten. Thursday at 7 p.m. is RCP Kids Ministry Training. Saturday at 10.30 a.m. is Outreach for All Ages. Please wear your RCP shirt in representation of the greatest assembly in this city. That evening at 6 p.m. is Ladies and Men's Meeting. Sunday, September 11th, join us at 10 a.m. for Foundation Classes for All Ages. Then at 11 a.m. and 4 p.m., we will have worship and the word. Mark your calendars for Sunday, September 18th. It is Back to Church Sunday. Start inviting people now. It is time to get back to church. As a reminder, we ask that you bring no food or drink beyond water for any ages into the sanctuary or the overflow room. Also, we ask that any vessel holding water has a lid that screws on. Please, no cups with straws or open drinking ports that will spill in the unfortunate event it is knocked over. We thank you for helping us keep RCP clean and presentable. Before leaving today, remember to take two. Grab two business cards and be intentional about inviting two people to worship in the Word next week business cards are located at the Welcome Center. We encourage you to connect with us on social media. We update all of our events, monthly calendar, and important announcements through these means along with email and text messages. If you are not currently receiving emails or text messages, please grab your phone and send a quick text message to the RCP Ministry cell at 706-239-7641. For one. Place your first and last name in the text and your correct email. We welcome all of our guests today. Please make sure to fill out guest registration completely. We will not bombard you, but we would like to connect with you. If you would like to know more about God or RCP, please speak with the host or send us a message through email, social media, or call our ministry cell at 706-239-7641. Please feel comfortable today to join us in praise and worship. God has something for you. All you have to do is tell him you are ready to receive.
And while you're turning there, I want to take a moment to give honor to my pastor. And I do not take this privilege lightly, and I want to honor my great and wonderful wife. Hebrews 12, we're going to read verse 15, and I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. It says, look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. For the next few minutes, I want to speak on this topic of falling short of his grace. You may be seated. Once a month, the hyphen group, we get together and we meet and we have a you speak. And for you, those of you who don't know what that is, usually I'll put out a topic, whether it be um, a chapter in the Bible. This um, last month, it happened to be Hebrews 12, but sometimes we'll look at sermons from past or we'll look at individual scriptures, but we'll break it down. We'll dissect it. And it's up to them to bring their notes. And let's look at it as a group and, and uh, get feedback from each other. But last month, it was Hebrews 12. And I don't know why I picked that chapter. I just, I kept going back to it. So I was like, all right, Lord, there's something in here, either for me or somebody in the group. Well, last month, it was for me. And we continued to talk about the chapter. And I had read the chapter many, many times. But this verse didn't stick out to me until that night. And so we're all sitting together and we're going around the table and we're reading it. And one that stuck out to me, it says, look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. But I was confused because God gives us his grace. But I asked the Lord, I said, how is it that we can fail your grace if your grace is sufficient for all of our needs? God's grace is freely given and it's not determined by what we do. If we can't do anything to earn God's grace or favor, is it possible to lose it? Is it possible to stray away from that place of God's favor? If grace means unmerited or undeserved favor, and again in 2 Corinthians 12 and 19, it says, my grace is sufficient for thee. So how can we fail to receive his grace? I mold it over for days. I mean, even in the you speak, we'd spent 10 or 15 minutes just on this one little portion of failing to receive his grace until it finally hit me. And it was so simple is that his grace doesn't fail us. We fail his grace. But how do we fail that grace? Bitterness is the first one. In verse 15, it says, Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Here, bitterness is equated to a poisonous root. The Strong's Concordance says bitterness is a resentful spirit. And a resentful spirit is a feeling of being treated unfairly. Mm. That right there, you could probably preach another 20-minute sermon on just that one little bit. But bitterness in our own lives starts slowly. Someone offends you. Poison's growing. You get passed over for promotion at work. That poison is spreading. Because don't get it wrong, bitterness will creep in on both sides, spiritually and in the, in the carnal realm. Then after all of that hurt, somebody in the church offends you or a pastor says something that you don't quite agree with. And all of a sudden, now you're questioning sound biblical doctrine. You're questioning teaching that you've looked at and realized as a child that this was the truth. But because of bitterness, you don't know what to believe anymore. Because bitterness, and hear me, bitterness will always lead to error. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God through Christ has forgiven you. Another thing that causes us to fail, his grace is unforgiveness. Matthew 6 and 14 says, if you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, your father will not forgive your sins. Forgiveness is essential to our daily walk and how can we expect to receive God's grace when we can't give it to one another? We must forgive one another. We must extend that same grace to others. And lastly, carnality will keep us from God's grace. Romans 8, 5, and 6, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit mind things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. The writer of Hebrews talks in the very beginning of chapter 15 that we are not to do this alone it says for we should look to one another we are to help one another through this life you know <clears throat> brother joseph if you see me failing if you see that i'm failing god's grace or if you see that there's a part of my life that is not quite right 
that may be affecting me and affecting my leadership, it's your job. It is your charge to come find me and bring to me and say, brother, you are failing his grace today. But it's also, we must extend grace to others. In Galatians 6 and 1, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fail into the same temptation yourself. As the worship team comes, it is time for this church to rise up. It is time for this church to rise up as warriors of peace, warriors of grace, warriors of people who come together and say, Brother, I've got you. Sister, I've got you. Because His grace is sufficient for me and sufficient for you. So as the worship team
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Don't it feel wonderful to be back in church on a Sunday night? Amen. Praise God. Such an expectation in this house tonight. Hallelujah. We would like to welcome you, those that are watching us online, and those that are here in person. We would like to take this moment and welcome you to River City Pentecostals, where all things are possible. Amen. We want to go to the Lord in prayer tonight, pray over our service here this evening. We want to pray over the needs that have been brought uh, to us. We want to pray for uh, Fort Benning and the soldiers and the families of Fort Benning. We want to pray for their protection and their safety. We also want to pray for the Pentecostals of Whitberry, Pastor and Sister Mary. We want to pray for Grace Point of Fayetteville, Pastor and Sister Cockrell. We also want to pray for all the other needs that are listed. Somewhere. God knows every need. Amen. So if you would join with me in prayer tonight, you can stand or you can sit. We want to pray and ask God that he would have his way upon these needs and that God would have his way in this service here this evening. God, we thank you, Lord, for your presence that's in this house. We thank you, Lord, for everything, God, that you are doing, everything that you're going to do. Father, I ask you tonight that you would move upon these needs. God, you know the needs. You know the situations. We know, Lord, that there is nothing impossible for you. God, we pray for the soldiers on Fort Benning, God. I pray, Lord, that we would be able to reach those families. God, that you would touch those families, protect them. Lord, I pray that you would touch Brother and Sister Mary. God, and that you would touch Brother and Sister Cockrell, God. Lord, as they do a work for you, Jesus. I pray tonight, God, that you would move in the remainder of this service. God, that you would have your way. Help the man of God tonight to bring forth your word. God, help us tonight, God, to be receptive of what you'd have in store for us. I ask this in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a great big hand. Hallelujah. Oh, God, we praise you tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. At this time, we would like to uh, give unto the Lord. You know, you can't never outgive the Lord. He gave it all on Calvary for you and I. There is nothing that we can withhold from him. Hallelujah. So we want to ask that. Let's see. Where did I go? There it is. The declaration. We want to say a declaration over our offering. Upon the authority of your word I have given, and it shall be given to me. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. I am a tither. I bring my tithe today into your storehouse. Therefore, the enemy is rebuked and the curse is broken. I live under an open heaven. You pour out upon me such a blessing. There is not enough room to receive it. We receive jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, benefits and settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bills paid off, and debts demolished, royalties received. My whole family will be saved and walking with God. Perfect health and abundance to walk in divine favor and blessing. I am blessed going in, I am blessed going out. All that I do will prosper in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's put a praise on it tonight. If you believe that, won't you praise the Lord? Hallelujah! Praise God. As it is our custom, in accordance with Scripture, we'd like to bring our gift unto the Lord. 
So please follow the direction of our host. If you don't have anything to give financially, please take this time to greet someone in Jesus' name. We invite you just to worship the Lord with us. You can do that sitting, standing. You can come down to the altar. That is not about joining the church. That is about saying, I have a need and I need God to touch it today. And if you come down, someone will meet you here to worship with you and to praise with you. Have God touch your life today. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Don't you know that he is amazing and he is great? I'm thankful for him today. He gave his life for me. Thankful that he died upon a cross, that he gives us grace. I'm thankful that I can walk forgiven. He is a mighty good God.
was a battle, a war between death and life, and there was a tree, the Lamb of God was crucified, and he went on down to hell.
believe that. Continue in worship, continue in praise. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name, Jesus. God, I worship you. I praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise God. And it's always good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Good to see everybody this evening. And make a mental note that as long as we do 4 p.m. services, we need to get it cold in here before we get in here. AC is doing what it can do, folks. Praise God. But we're spoiled. Amen. We're spoiled already. Y'all don't remember those window units in the old church? Praise God. During the summer, they were just doing all they could do. Praise the Lord. Everybody was sweating. Preaching was sweating. You was the, even the people just sitting there, just not, not loving God, they were sweating, you know. Praise God. Amen. Thank you for coming. Such a great crowd here for our 4 p.m. service. We are going to start a uh, series tonight that I'm not too sure people are ready for. Amen. But here's the issue. When, the, when Adam and Eve were, uh, and y'all can bring that on, Adam and Eve were hiding uh, ready or not God was coming amen God was coming so we've, we've got to be able to deal with some issues now before we get into it while they set this up it's amazing I'm setting this up and there's like one part that I'll need it in but uh, Sunday nights, one reason why I struggle doing this on Sunday nights is because the format you kind of have to have. I, you can't preach this. We've just got to get into it and dig. All right? And the problem is, is that I, I, call, it, I call it dirty digging because you've got to be willing to get into the mess and the muck and the mire in order to get better. Jesus called and said, Lazarus, come forth. Lazarus had resurrection power, yet he was still in dead man's clothes. And oftentimes we get filled with the Holy Ghost and we just think, praise God, that's it, I'm done. And that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning. So we're starting a, a series on shame and not particularly just telling you what shame is. So you can look in your own life and go, ow, yeah, that, that hurts. But it's, it's kind of, Jesus looked at the layman and said, wilt thou be made whole? In other words, Jesus said, I've got the power to heal you. The question is, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? Uh, in one of our ladies sessions during ladies there was one particular lady who was coming to our church they were talking about this kind of issue and some shame issues and she said I would rather not revisit that which tells me ding 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 you don't want to go back there but you will hear this a lot if you still feel it then God hasn't healed it If you don't want to think about something because it hurts, guess what? It's not healed. Well, it's not bothering. I beg to differ. It is bothering you. Okay? So we're going to talk about shame. So let's pray. And let's go through this. There will be time at the end of this for you to pray. I am going to tell you. There's something about praying in the Spirit. It renews your mind. We will talk about that renewing of the mind. You, you can't just get pansy prayers and be healed. No, you've got to get to where you're like, I, I've got to get this out. I have to, 
I had a boil on my leg one time and they lanced it. B believe me, I made sounds. Because they not only lanced it, they had to push all that infection out. And I'm telling you, I said, all right, you tell me when you're ready to push. He said, all right, now. Ah! And we find out some deep, ugly stuff in our lives and we come in prayer. No, sometimes it's got to be groanings. I cannot continue to live this way. Okay? So we're going to get there. So let's start with prayer. Let's end with prayer, all right? Let's pray. God, I thank you for this time to come together. Ah, oh, my Lord. Pray, Lord, that your word do its work, God. That, Lord, you, you, you don't allow us just to stay the way that we are, God. But, Lord, as they would in the hospital, let your spirit poke and prod, Lord, and examine and assess our hearts, Lord. Help us, God, to be made whole. Help us, God, so that we, Lord, would walk in victory. God, I ask you to do this, Lord. Guide my words, Lord. Let, them, let the words, God, not be of me, but of you. God, use me as a conduit for your glory, God, and the advancement of your kingdom, God. Hallelujah. I ask it in Jesus' name. Somebody say in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Unresolved shame. Unresolved shame is the most debilitating condition that we contend with today. It is the root of most Christian inconsistency. Most inconsistencies within Christians and their walk is because of unresolved shame. It is the primary reason why we do not pray. It is the foundational reason why people backslide. So what we're going to do is we're going to examine shame. We're going to examine its effects on our lives and on God's people. And um, we're pretty much going to do as God does in his word. We're going to start from the end before we get to the beginning. Uh, so what, what is the most important result for the church when the people of God are free from shame? What is that most important? Why is it important for us to be free from shame? Now, when I go into this, a lot of people are going to say, oh, pastor's gone into psychobabble. I have had one psychology class in my life. One. And, and I, it was one of my favorite classes, but I don't remember a whole lot of it because the dude loved to talk about Freud, and that's some twisted stuff. So what I'm telling you is that there is enough within the word of God to deal with shame. Okay? So what is the reason? Well, here it is. The removal or the dealing with shame in the lives of God's people, it is the last step before the promised outpouring of the Holy Ghost in the last days. What is holding up the outpouring of God's Spirit? People of God not wanting to be healed of shame. That is what's holding it up. Well, if God, no, God, God binds himself by his word. He will back up his word. So where do we see this in the word of God? Joel, the second chapter, the 25th through the 28th verse. Joel 2, verse 25 through 28. It says, and I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. 
And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward. And I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Twice. Twice in this text the Lord promised that his people would never be ashamed. How do we get there? How do we as his people get to that place today where we are not ashamed. Also, how do we receive this promise of the outpouring that shall come to pass afterward? After what? We see it's after restoration of years that were taken from us. We see that it's after God brings us to a place that my people shall never be ashamed. We see that. So because of the proximity of the absence of shame to the promise of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, it seems to be very imperative that we have an understanding of what shame is and how to deal with shame. Because when we are truly free from shame, God will be able to give us the revival and the harvest that we are able to receive it we won't abort it because of our shameful natures, our inconsistencies. God, why are you not doing it? Why? Why do we see this? Why? Would and oftentimes we're like David. Wilt thou not revive us, O Lord? Asking God a question that he is, he is more than able, capable, and willing to do. It's not about whether or not God will revive us. It's about whether or not we want to be healed. Or whether or not we want to be revived. Or whether or not we want to lay down this conditioning of our mind, our will, and our emotions that has happened because of shame. He's going to restore unto us. The prerequisite for Holy Ghost outpouring is restoration. Period. That is the prerequisite of Holy Ghost outpouring. So what is restoration? Restoration in the Strong's Concordance means to be safe in mind, body, or estate. It means to be complete or to be made complete. Vines says to restore is to recompense, reward, be whole, be complete, and be sound. Brown, Driver, and Briggs, it says restoration is to be in a covenant of peace. To be at peace, to make peace with, to cause to be at peace, to be complete, to be sound, to be sound and uninjured, to make safe, to make whole or good, to restore or make compensation. Restoration, God's people being restored is to make us to the place that we are uninjured. Outpouring shall take place after, afterwards. Well, let's look at the word afterwards. The word afterwards is actually Hebrew, but it's made up of two words. It's not like our English word afterwards. We know what afterwards means. After, afterwards, we'll go eat. Afterwards, but it's a little more complex when you look at the Hebrew word. It's of these two Hebrew words, one akar and one kin. A card means on the hinder part. It means afterwards. It means on the back side of it. It means what we mean. But there's an extra word that's put in this Hebrew word for afterwards. It's kin. And kin means to set upright. To be made just. To be made rightfully so. How about this? To be made right in various applications in manner of time and relation. A complete word study dictionary puts this word ken in. It's a word 
derived from the verb meaning to stand upright and to be established. To be made correct. Brown, Driver, and Briggs puts that word kin as right, just, righteous, honest, true. So when we see this restoration of being afterward, afterward, it's saying after you have been made upright and to be established, after you have been put back on your feet and standing upright, after you have been made righteous and just and honest, after those things, then I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I'm telling you it is time, high time and past time for us to walk into the restoration that God wants us to walk into. We have to, we have to get this and we have to have a desire and a hunger to be better. Theological word book of the Old Testament says restore. The general meaning behind the root is of completion and fulfillment. Of entering into a state of wholeness and unity. A restored relationship. Before we can have restored relationship, we must first understand about the importance of the relationships that the Lord gives to be priority in our lives. We must understand that. We must obey the greatest and the second greatest commands of the Bible. Must. If we are going to please God and we are going to be His children, we've got to, have to, obey fully the first and the second commandments. Those greatest. Actually, in one passage of Scripture, he says, there is no greater commandment than these. In other words, he was saying you can't separate one from the other. In Mark the 12th chapter, the 28th through the 31st verse. It says, and one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. Lord, our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment, and the second commandment is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. He puts them together as one commandment. He says you can't separate it from the other. You can't say you love God and not love God your neighbor but in these two commandments if you want to put them as two there is defined three fundamental relationships in life the first relationship is my relationship with God the other relationship is my relationship with others and there is another relationship that is in there it is my relationship with myself he says you've got to love your neighbor as you love yourself. The pivotal relationship of these three is the way that we feel about ourselves. Whether or not I'm able to love myself affects my ability to love God and it affects my ability to love others. This is a huge issue in the church because we've got a lot of people, once again, that have resurrection power. They've received the Holy Ghost. But they don't even, they've put a, we put a low price on ourselves when he put a high price on us. We devalue ourselves and oftentimes sell ourselves out to thoughts that are so low and bid so low beneath the price that he paid for us. It is the pivotal relationship to your relationship with God and your relationship with others. It is your relationship with self. If I believe that I am unlovable, I will refuse to receive God's love for me. 
if I convince myself that I am not worthy of his love, then I will reject any sign of his love. Therefore, I to myself become unloved. Because God will not show his love to you against your will. Oftentimes, people don't receive the Holy Ghost because they don't see themselves as worthy of receiving the Holy Ghost. They, there is something in them that they feel is so unredeemable, unlovable, unforgivable that how could they ever receive this gift from God that is given out of his grace and out of his love that's an easy one to see but that's not the only one to see that's oftentimes why we are attracted to toxic relationships because we feel that's all we deserve is that toxic relationship hurt people hurt people Hear me, esteem, esteem for myself cannot come from myself. Accepting my worth also cannot come from myself. My only scriptural source of understanding of worth of self is the revelation of God's love for me. That is the only scriptural basis that we have for worth is how does he love me? You see the girls is plucking up the flower and he loves me. He loves me not. 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 And oftentimes with that, we're looking for something to complete us that is from somebody who is often incomplete in and of themselves. So we put unrealistic expectations on our spouses to complete us and heal us. And the fact is, is they can't even heal themselves. So how can they heal you? If I only had a man, I can, no, no, no. You don't need to bring a man into your baggage. You need God to heal you. I would be complete if I only had a woman. No, no. You don't need to bring somebody into your terror and bring more heartache and more pain and more. No. It is true in marriage, it is true in life that we create our own beast. And oftentimes the beasts that we create are out of unresolved issues and shame in our lives. The fact of the matter is, is we cannot get our own self-esteem. We have to have it in something in God and in God's love. We, We must be worth a whole lot. We must be worth a tremendous amount because he chose to die for every one of us. That's the price he paid. How do you put a price on that? That is priceless. And once again, why do we prostitute our worth to low thoughts when he gave us the highest price? His value of us is where we receive love And we do not know how to love unless we can receive his love. It's his value for us. 1 John, the third chapter, the 16th verse, it says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Why do we not lay down our lives for one another? Because we haven't fully received the fact that he laid down his life for us. Romans the 8th chapter, the 31st through the 32nd verse says, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? 
He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? All things. Accepting God's love without reservation is the channel through which I receive everything that God does for me, naturally or spiritually. Does everybody get that? Us being able, having the capacity, getting healed to where we can accept God's love without reservation. That is the channel through which we will receive everything God does for us. The reason why we say that's too good to be true is we don't think we're worth good things. We don't think we're worth good things because we haven't fully received his love for us. If we really received his love for us, we would look at even the best things and say, that's not good enough to be true. God loves me beyond that. God loves me more than that. And it's not that I'm entitled, it's that I'm loved. Do you hear me? I can receive good things physically. I can receive good things spiritually because I know that he loves me. His love put the price tag for me. We've got to be able to accept that love. 1 John, the 4th chapter, the 19th verse. It says, we love him because he first loved us. The living Bible, that same verse says, so you see, our love of him comes as a result of his loving us first. The Bible in basic English says, we have the power of loving Because he first had love for us. The complete Jewish Bible says we ourselves love now because he loved us first. Which means you don't know what love is until you can receive the love of God. If you can't receive the love of God fully, you will always fall for love that is not his. That is not in line with his. It will always be incomplete, always be insufficient. It's knowing I know how to love people because I am able to receive how he loved me. Let's get this right. Let's get this true, okay? A man that's married to his wife, he will not be able to truly show that wife true love and the love that needs to be shown if he himself has not received God's love for him, does not believe that God loves him that much or that he can be that loved. Do you see our capacity to receive his love? It unlooses our capacity to love. It is in direct correlation. So if our capacity to receive his love for us is restricted, then there's a restricted amount of love we can show. We only know how to love the way we receive his love for us. The reason why we have people in the church that have a hard time forgiving is because they have a hard time realizing and receiving that they themselves have been forgiven. Has he really for We can preach about it and we can talk about it, but oftentimes we walk like we are not forgiven. We talk like we're not forgiven. Our inconsistent attitudes and spirits, everything. You know what it is? I, listen, I don't, I, I, you don't come in here on a Sunday and me just tap you on the back and say, hey, what are you thinking about right now? What did you wake up thinking about right now? You, you, I don't have to do that. There's, there's no reason to do that kind of stuff because we don't like to know that anybody's digging in our laundry. But oftentimes we wake up thinking the wrong things. We went to bed thinking the wrong things, thinking about something we did before BC, before Christ. And it's got consumed us and we wake up and it puts us in a foul mood. Now we're inconsistent and it's hard for us to show any love towards anybody else because we can't receive and truly believe that God's forgiven that mess. He's put me upright. Let it rain, Jesus. His love. His love is the conduit through which all of his blessings flow to us. His love. If I will not allow him to love me unconditionally, he cannot save me. He cannot heal me. He cannot supply my needs. He cannot answer my prayers. Because I have put a restriction 
on what I can receive from him. He will not meet my needs for the purpose of enabling me to feel that I have earned something from him. Does everybody get this? I want to, God will not just meet your needs just so you can be enabled and say that you've, you've earned something from him. Let's put it this way. He only, God only meets our needs to communicate to us how he feels about us. He loves us because of who we are, not because of what we do. We talk about these five love languages and all those kind of things, and I love the funny thing that's come out where somebody has uh, identified like 35 different love languages, and, you know, it's like Starbucks is one of the love languages and all that, you know, but I love it. We talk about these five love languages. What is God's love language? Can anybody identify what God's love language is? Can anybody really tell me what his love language is? Do you think that your acts of service will communicate to him anything that will make him love you anymore? And the reason why we continue to... Oh, my Lord, have mercy. The reason why we continue to try to just do good and be a good person is because we have not received God's forgiveness in our lives. Therefore, we don't feel like good people. So surely he can't love me because of who I am because I don't even love who I am. My thoughts go dark. How can he love me? So the best that I can do and the best that I can offer him is, is to serve my way into his good graces and just be a good girl or be a good boy. And the fact of the matter is God loves you, hear me, for who you are. Right now, he loves you for who you are. There is not an amount of sin that could overcome his grace and his love for you. So there's not an amount of righteous deeds that can make him love you anymore. Who you are. Bumps, bruises, everything. He loves every bit of it. Shame is what prevents us from believing this. I wonder if we can pray right now. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. God, it's your work. It's your word, Lord. God, I pray you break through the pride and condemnation. Break through it. God, help us to receive your word, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here, here, here's, here's the crux of it. My performance does not produce relationship. My relationship with him produces performance. And oftentimes we get burnt out in serving him because we've got it twisted. We think that my performance is what produces a relationship with him. And that's not true. And oftentimes that's all we have because we don't have prayer lives because we have shame. So the best we can offer him is our performance, but it's inadequate. It's a relationship, a true relationship with him that produces performance in our lives. My capability for loving others is severely diminished when I do not love myself. Severely diminished when I do not love myself. Amen. And guess what? Your capability of receiving love from others is severely diminished when you don't love yourself. That's why there are people in this church that I can come up and I can give you a compliment and tell you, you did an awesome job tonight. And you will, you will face it with some like, sarcasm or snarky remark or a look or something you know why you don't know how to receive that 
Why do you not know how to receive that? Because there's something broken. You can't receive it because you don't believe it. You don't believe it about yourself. Mark the 12th chapter, the 31st verse. It's when it says, and the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. The Living Bible says, you must love others as much as yourself. Today's English version says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. The Message Bible says, love others as well as you love yourself. Easy to read Bible. I need to read through that for a year. <laughs> love your neighbor the same as you love yourself. Contemporary English version says, love others as much as you love yourself. I mean, it, it, can you get any clearer than that? Loving others is the fundamental element for revival. Loving others is the fundamental element for revival. If my inability to let God help me to love myself hinders his ability to love others through me, then my shame has now become an impassable roadblock to revival. Because I am incapable of loving other people. So what it is saying is the outpouring of Joel 2.28 that we began with, that promise, it is only promised after we have restoration to wholeness. To where not only can I receive God's love for me, but I can look myself in the mirror and, and legitimately say, you are forgiven, you are whole, you are anointed, you are loved, you're going to do something great for God because you are a child of the King. Until we legitimately have love for ourselves, what we do is we try to fill it with stuff. Anybody ever seen anything with hoarders? I, I worked in, in hoarders. Uh, uh, the, the, the issue is, is that everything has, a has, has a, everything has meaning. Everything. They're trying to fill a hole that is only meant for God. And, and so they just keep, keep pulling, keep pulling, keep pulling, keep pulling, keep pulling. To move something is to just do great harm to them. Don't, no, 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 no. I need that. I need that because they're trying to find completion in stuff. I mean, literally, I've gone into houses where they needed a dishwasher replaced. And they had aisles, stacks of magazines and papers this big. And I'm like, this, this needs to be this big. And I started moving stuff and they freaked out. Because they're trying to find completeness and wholeness in stuff that will never make you whole. It will never do it. So if I'm not able to help others and I'm not able to love others because of how I've received the love of God, then I then become a hindrance to the outpouring. So the question is, what needs to be restored? What really needs to be restored? Do you believe that God has created us in his image and in his likeness? Genesis 1, 26 and 27, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. 1 Corinthians 11 and 7 says, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. The image, Strong says, the likeness, the representation, the resemblance. The, uh, another image in Vine says the word involves the two ideas of representation but also manifestation. What it's saying is that image is not merely just the external resemblance. 
but the manifested image of God that can only come from internally. That we were not only created in his image externally. We were in the beginning before the fall created in his image in our mind, in our soul, our thinking, our will, our emotions was all manifestation of the image of God. Romans the 8th chapter, the 29th verse. It says, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That word conformed. That word conformed into the image of his son. Means jointly formed. Similar and fashioned like unto. It also means having the same form as another. The verb here has more special reference to that which is essential in character and thus complete or durable, not merely the form or outline. We have been made to, we have been conformed to the image of his son. What it's saying is that it's not just conformed on the outside. It's not just outward conformity. What he's saying is I've given you power that you would also be conformed in your character, in your nature, so that you would be durable and complete. The reason why we're so inconsistent is because we have oftentimes conformed to outward things. But we have yet to be conformed to the nature of God, to the character of God, to his attributes. That's why the Bible says, do not render evil for evil. What it's saying is, no, the world's going to tell you that if somebody does something to you, then you have a right to do that back to them. That's the world's image. That's the world's character. That's the world's attributes. But what did God say? What did Jesus say? He says 70 times 7, you forgive them. Somebody hits you, you turn the other cheek. Do not render. Do not render worldly character for worldly character. But rather, render the character of Christ when worldly character confronts you. Why can't we do that? Shame. Shame. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm saved, but you try me. You'll catch these hands. And I'm not a punk. Where did that come from? You're so busy trying not to prove you're a punk that you're being ungodly and not Christ-like. And you have all the other Christians going, no, you have a right to be like that. You know why? Shame. Shame. Conformity here in this scripture is not just the outside. It's by his nature and his character. And the, and, and the vine says that it is complete and durable. It's not like conformed in Romans, the 12th chapter, the first and second verse. Romans, the 12th chapter, verse 1 and 2, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. This word, conformed, is a different word altogether. It means to fashion or shape one thing like another. But it also tells us that it is in reference to that which is transitory, changeable, and unstable. It is a different conformed than the conformity that God is asking for us into the image of God. We oftentimes, we oftentimes allow the world to transform us and we become conformed to godliness. Which means that we become Unstable, undurable, we get it twisted, 
We get it the wrong way around. That's why the world continues to go along with the fashions and trends of the... I mean, the church continues to go along with the fashions and trends of the world. Because we allow the world to transform us. Well, I just don't think there's anything wrong with this. Stop thinking and get in the Word of God. What does the Word of God say? This isn't about our opinion. I don't want my kids to be ostracized. Oh, why do you not want that? Were you ostracized? Is there shame that you have about the life that you live? Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. I've said this many times in, in pastoring that I, there's oftentimes I'm like, you know what? It, 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 I think about people. And let's look at couples in the church. Sometimes I look and I go, if something were to happen to their spouse, they would not live this life. You know why? Because you can tell it's not in their heart. They don't love it. They don't. How, how can I tell that? Because they dance on the edge. They're always right there on the edge trying to, you know, let's see, let's see what. They spend more thoughts about what, what kids can do in the world than they do spend about what they can do in the church. It's, it's always right there on the edge. And as a pastor, you can always see that. And the fact of the matter that people are getting upset with me saying that proves it. It proves the reason why if it wasn't an issue in your heart, you wouldn't feel anything about what I'm saying. Does that hurt? That was the doctor going, does that hurt? The reason it hurts is because it's true. It's because it's true. If it wasn't true, we'd be like, yes, pastor, that's true. But when it comes true, we're like, oh, I'm dead. Just blow up like a bullfrog, right? Because, it, because it, the word of God touched something that we don't want it to touch. Just, just don't do that. Allow me, allow me to allow the world to transform my thinking and those kind of things. And I just want to be conformed in this kind of conformity. I want to be conformed in this kind of conformity to God's character where it's, it's not complete, where it's transitory, it's changeable, it's unstable. But God is wanting to transform us, to conform us, to restore us to something that is unchangeable. It is durable. It is durable. Why do we need? Why? Why do we need to be conformed into his image? It may sound like a silly question. But the fact is, is that Proverbs tells us that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. In other words, what a man thinks about himself, that is his truth. You will hear me say this oftentimes. Perception is just as real as reality. I love it when I'm talking to people and they're like, no, this is what they meant. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Okay, would you stand before God and say that you're sure without talking to them about their intention? No. The reason why you're sure is because your perception is your reality. So we, we freely, in order to justify how we feel at that particular time, we freely, freely twist and filter what we have received to justify how we feel. To justify actions. Thoughts produce actions. Wrong thinking will produce Wrong actions. My feelings about myself produce wrong thoughts about myself. Do you hear that? It, it's all there. Wrong thoughts. Thus, I, I cannot do the will of God when my thinking is wrong about myself. You called me to do what? Gideon? What he was dealing with Gideon was his thoughts about himself. I've got to deal with how you're thinking. I can't take you into what I've called you to do until your thinking lines up to me. Children of Israel, 40 years in the wilderness. Why? Because they're thinking about what they can do in Christ was wrong. Wasted time in the church because people have wrong thinking about themselves. Therefore, the promise is held up. It's all there. 
I must be transformed into his image of me so that I will think the thoughts that he wants me to think. What will this do? If I'm thinking the thoughts that God wants me to think, then I'm able to do what God has asked me to do. That's the way it is. If I am thinking what he thought about me, and I'm thinking the thoughts that he wants me to think, then I, I'm not going to have a problem doing what God has asked me to do. We've got to walk into his character. Now, y'all have seen this. Some people haven't. Three parts of man. The trichotomy of man. Okay, this is you. Some of you may feel that way. I feel that way often. The trichotomy, three parts of man. Spirit, soul, flesh. Now, when we are born, we are born mortal men or death-doomed men, which means that your spirit here. It is dead in trespasses and sins. When you are born because of the fall, we are born with our spirit dead in trespasses and sins. Your soul, your soul has three things in it. Okay? Three things in it. It is your mind, your will, and your emotions. That is your soul. What we do Without Christ, what we do is we allow the flesh to act out to find some kind of satisfaction for how we think about ourselves, what we will to do, and, and how we feel about ourselves. All of that right there. When we receive the Holy Ghost, God comes right here. When you receive the Holy Ghost, God comes into the spirit of man and flips a light on. Well, I can live here. I've got to do some cleaning. Most people, and I would dare say some people here tonight, that's as far as you have gotten in your relationship with God. He's living there, and he's trying to clean up. But you don't want him to mess with your soul. Truly it is about saving the souls of men. Because yes God I'll, con I'll conform to whatever you want on the outside. Just don't mess with the way I think about myself. Don't mess with the way I feel about myself. And don't mess with my will. I want to do what I want to do. You just stay in the spirit realm to where every now and then I can come in and speak in tongues and lick my spiritual lollipop and say that I have a relationship with God. And God, I will do all these acts of service on the outside to show you that I love you. But don't mess with this part right here. But Jesus is truly on the inside working towards the outside. So he's trying to heal us in our mind, our will, and the Now, I don't have time to go into this. But your will is where pride resides. Anytime something happens to you that is hurtful or harmful, anytime somebody has done you wrong or somebody has done trauma in your life, you begin to form prideful thoughts in your life. I will do this. I will, I will never be in this position again. I will never love somebody like that again. I will never. It's an element of pride. That's where pride resides. Your mind is where the bully of shame happens. Your mind is where condemnation is. That's why your thoughts begin to beat up on you. Your thoughts about what happened 20 years ago, you begin to just, condemnation just beats up and tells you, you're worthless, you're a nobody, you can't do anything for, that's where condemnation, but your emotions, that's where shame dwells. Because shame is the emotion of sin. Shame. And they work together. They're the unholy trinity. This right here is the perverted or twisted state of the soul of man. Where pride, condemnation, and shame dwells. Why is it important that you have no shame? Because 
You see him, Rafiki. Yes, I'm taking spiritual extrapolations from Lion King. Do not judge me. You see Rafiki. Ha, 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 ha. And you see Simba. And Rafiki takes that little staff and goes, Wow! Bops Simba on the head. Ow! Why did you do that? It doesn't matter. It's in the past. Right? But Simba's still going, it still hurts. Exactly. What they did to you, it's been years. But it still hurts. What you did and you chose to do. Oftentimes it's the things we do ourselves that hurts the most. You chose to do that action. You chose to put yourself in that predicament. You chose to do those drugs. You chose to get in a drunken stupor. That's why you woke up in that bed. And you didn't even know who that was. You chose to do that. It doesn't matter. It's in the past. But here, this is the devil's playground because if he can keep you all twisted and messed up here, your condemnation will come in. You'll wake up one morning and you'll think, uh, why did that thought hit? But with that thought comes the feeling. All of a sudden you feel embarrassed again. And all of a sudden you start making these, these declarations again, these prideful declarations going on there. Why is it important? Okay, this is why it's important. Anybody ever had God nudge you to go pray for somebody in public? Any, just me. Okay. God nudge you to go do something in public? The problem is, is it should produce immediate action. But it's filtered through this messed up area. I don't want to do that. That's going to be embarrassing. You know, you know why you're worried about being embarrassed? Because you've been embarrassed. That's shame. When someone tells you about a deep, dark skeleton in their closet and you get embarrassed for them, the reason you're embarrassed for them is shame. So it's got to be filtered. So why can the outpouring not happen? Because God can't abort what he's wanting to do because we won't do what he wants us to do. So he's waiting for us to get healed in our emotions and in our mind and to submit our will to him to the point that when he directs us to do something it goes directly through a heart that wants to please him and does what he asks us to do without any thought about being embarrassed or what will they think about me this is important for us to come into the image of God in every area of our life. By the way, you can find in the scripture when it talks about he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. If you study that scripture, it is not just for your physical healing and your spiritual salvation. It is every man. The complete work of Calvary is the complete healing and wholeness and restoration of the whole part of you why do we not bring prayer requests to the church oftentimes we don't bring prayer requests to the church because of our pride we don't want anybody to know that there's something in us that's incomplete why because we're incomplete we're not healed we've got to walk into his character and what God has for us. It's got to be the saved mind. We've got to cast down imaginations. 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 through 6. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The casting down imaginations. And every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of of God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Everybody hearing it? Imaginations, knowledge, thoughts. Over and over, we see that this weapon is to be used not just for spiritual battle, but the war within. 
2 Timothy, the first chapter, the seventh verse, it says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Strong's says that mind is the intellect, the, div- the mind, divine or human, in thought, feeling, or will. Thinking, mind, feeling, emotions, and will. What is this saying? It's saying that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love, our ability to receive his love for us, and of a sound mind, will, and emotion. That's what God has given us. The Greek word for love in the first two relationships is agape. Therefore, the implied word for loving myself must also be agape. Those two commandments, love God, love your neighbor. It's implied that I must love myself with agape. Agape love has its source in God alone. It is not possible for us to produce a love that satisfies God's criteria of what constitutes love through our own strength or through our own human emotions. By the way, in the Hebrew, there is no sensual or sexual love. That came from the Greeks. Hello? That came from the heathenistic people who were involved in orgies and all kinds of stuff. Well, praise God. I'm sorry. I said words that parents are going to have to explain. Just say it's a bad thing. Agape love. It's God's criteria of love. We must allow God to enable us to love him. How do we know it? We've got to love him. I've got to receive his love. I must allow God to love others through me. It's vitally important that we allow God to help us to love ourselves. To help us to love ourselves. Do you know do you know that you have never seen yourself ever You've seen a rendering of yourself. You've seen a picture of yourself. You've seen a reflection of yourself. But you have never seen yourself. The way we see ourselves is always skewed. Oftentimes it's like looking at a funhouse mirror. It's always skewed. Do you know, you're sitting right now, you're thinking, well, uh, my ears are like Dumbo, blah, blah, blah. But other people don't see you that way. My nose are this. My eyes are this. My, uh, we go through all of these things as to what disqualifies us from being worthy. It's not about beauty. It's about being worthy. Worthy to be loved. Worthy to be cherished. Worthy to be adored. Worthy of anything good. We go through all of these things that disqualify us, yet God sees us, and God loves us, and he loved us enough to pay a high price, to pay a high price. 